OK Magazine said that she is, and I quote, the woman responsible for bringing sex to the high street and liberating thousands of women between the sheets. She has been voted the most inspirational businesswoman of the year by Barclays Bank. And in addition to that, she has built up Ann Summers from an £83,000 a year business to over £150 million. So we're delighted to be with Jacqueline Gold today. Jacqueline, welcome. Thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. Jacqueline, we've done a lot of research on you and your company and etc. And we found that one question that you seem to get asked all the time, so maybe we can just, there's two questions, but we will maybe go into the second one later on. <laughs> but the first question is, who is this Anne Summers person? Well, Anne Summers was the person that originally worked in the very first Anne Summers store in Marble Arch um, in the early 1970s. Um, she actually, her name was Anise Goodwin, and she changed her name by deed poll so that the store had a figurehead. And the original uh, owner chose the name Anne Summers because he felt it depicted the image of an English rose. Um, but um, from what I understand, she was there for about a year before the business went into liquidation. I see. Got it. And then the second question you get asked all the time, as I understand, is do you wear your products and services? <laughs> <laughs> just, there is like a third question as well, but I'll, there just, is. Answer, I'll just answer the second. <laughs> <laughs> um, of course, I, I probably have the... Um, the biggest range of, uh, of lingerie, um, but yes, I, I, I do wear the Anne Summers underwear. Okay, we won't go to the but third, that's for, the third. that's for another interview. Um, if we can start just by giving us, and it's good to get those two out of the way, we'll get the third one later, but um, if you can just start by giving us a uh, quick biography of, you know, so we can get to know you, Jacqueline Gold, where were you born, all the way through to a possible you know, to today and sitting where you are. We'd we like to start with a challenge. If you can do that, <laughs> everything else will be easy after that. <laughs> well, I was born in Beckenham in Kent. Um, I lived most of my childhood in Biggin Hill in Kent. Uh, my parents divorced uh, when I was the age, at the age of 12. I have uh, a younger sister who's seven years younger than me. And we went to uh, a private girls' school. Um, I was always very ambitious. I... Uh, I had lots of part-time jobs when I was sort of younger, in my, in my teens. Um, worked in hairdressers, I, I uh, worked in a restaurant. Um, I used to design crossword puzzles at the age of 13 for 50 pence a time. Um, and then I went to Roald Dalton um, for part-time work. And it was while I was there, I decided to, for work experience, um, join Anne Summers. I had no intention of staying. It was a very male-orientated business. Mm. And it was while I was there that I was invited to a Tupperware-style party, which is where I, I got my idea from. Thank you for that. That was very comprehensive. In fact, thank you for a great interview. Yeah. <laughs> um, Jacqueline, so Anzam is now, and, and that's now one of the biggest privately owned companies in the UK, isn't it? Well, I think we might be in the top 200, yes. It's phenomenal. Phenomenal. And um, if we can just start with, uh, we seem, seem to know that every company that's very successful has a big idea behind it and and does this quote you think encapsulate the big idea b behind your vision for Anne Summers we've empowered women to take control in the bedroom we are buying women are buying to spice up their sex lives they want to feel good about themselves it's not just about turning on the men in their life so is it really about the liberation of the sexuality of women you think oh absolutely I mean when I started and the, the sort of new Anne Summers uh, oh almost 30 years ago, um, you know, there wasn't anything available for women. If women wanted to buy um, a sex toy or some sexy underwear, you couldn't even buy sexy underwear in the high street then. They would have to go to uh, a sex shop in, in the back street, and that's really what I, you know, what I set about changing. Women wanted to be able to buy sexy underwear, mm. um, but in a more female-friendly environment. Mm, absolutely. And I suppose that goes behind a, a significant trend that's taken place as well that you've, you've, uh, you've been able to take advantage of in the fact that in the UK there's been that trend in the background. Oh, absolutely. I, I think that, um, you know, over a period of time, and I'd like to think that Anne Summers has instigated this, you know, women, yeah. you know, have become much more aware of their own sexuality. Um, they're much more in control of their lives, whether it be their professional lives or in the bedroom, you know. 30 years ago, women, uh, you know, a lot of women or men expected women to lie back and think of England. Uh, <laughs> luckily, they don't do that anymore. Um, and women, you know, it's a, a much more equal role in the bedroom. And I think that's much, you know, it's, a, it's positive. I think that's what men like as well.
Absolutely. Um, I'm saying absolutely in agreement <laughs> with you. Um, <laughs> when, yeah, because indeed, when you started out, I believe, uh, you had about, was it 10% of your customers were female? Now it's about 80%, is that? The customer profile has completely changed. Um, when I first started, as you say, 10% of our customers were women. Um, and we've had a complete role reversal. We've now got 80% of our customers going into store are women, even to the point where, you know, I'd like to get the men back in. Oh, really? If you give me a 20% discount, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be back in. Um, because you, you really trans transformed Anne Summers, as you mentioned earlier, about this idea of being able to sell sex toys and sex, sexy lingerie to women in the comfort and privacy of their own home. So how did you actually um, have that idea, and what was the need you think you were actually fulfilling at that point? Um, I, as I said earlier, I think the fact that women wanted to buy sexy underwear, yeah. uh, they wanted to spice up their love lives, but they didn't want to go into a sex shop. You know, it was quite, you know, it was uh, in, a bit embarrassing, a bit intimidating maybe. Um, and the whole idea of just women, and, and I made a decision right from the beginning that men weren't going to be allowed at parties. Um, it, it was brilliant because, you know, they were completely at ease to try on the underwear, you know, have a few glasses of wine, and it actually evolved into, you know, it wasn't just a place to shop, it was also a very fun, entertaining evening. Yeah, because Jacqueline, you, um, I imagine that, and you've done a great job, and they've only grown since then, haven't they? I mean, how many, how many Tupperware parties are there, approximately? I mean, we hold 5,000 parties a week now, so, uh, and of course, the, the parties were a stepping stone into retail, um, and have really become an induction, if you like, um, into the sort of world of Ann Summers. You, you mentioned right at the beginning, way back when, when there wasn't the same liberation. And I imagine that during that course, since you started, you've probably come up with a lot of prejudices yourself and people with misconceptions. So, um, in fact, I know that you have, because I think one of your board of directors said, and I quote, women, this will never work, because women are not aren't interested in sex. Um, <laughs> so is, this, yes. is that true? Yes. That I mean, not that they're not interested in sex, but, but this guy actually said that. It was absolutely true. It was when I was putting my idea to the board. Um, obviously, it says more about his sex life than it did about my <laughs> idea. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a, a ridiculous comment to make. Um, but there was nothing available to women then, and it was very much a man's world. Um, and, you know, Anne Summers then, the customers were mainly uh, men and the, you know, the workforce were mainly men. They, they, you know, that was their perception or certainly his perception. Yeah, that's right. So presumably he didn't really last for the Jack and Gold's brand values and he was uh, out. No, he, he, he went quite soon after <laughs> <laughs> got going. Um, talking about prejudice, I mean, you know, when you started out, obviously, as you said, the sex industry was very much dominated by men. In fact, the business world, you know, you know, most chief executives are going to be men. Um, so how have you actually been able to deal with uh, prejudice as you come across it like that in your career and override it like you have done so well? I mean, it really has been very challenging. Um, certainly at the beginning, I was a young woman alone in the sex injury is how I felt. Yeah. Um, and I just felt very passionate about my idea. And I knew that there were a lot of women out there supporting me that really loved the idea, women that wanted to join, they wanted financial independence, and I just persevered. Um, I made very few compromises uh, when it came to the brand and its values, um, and slowly chipped away at society, and, and particularly, um, you know, counsellors, uh, you know, it was, it, it was that type of individual that really made my life difficult. Um, and, you know, as we grew and as, uh, you know, I, I got involved in doing publicity, interviews, and just really about public awareness, um, you know, the slowly but surely, uh, you know, we've, we've become, we're quite unique. And I think at the beginning, people didn't know what to do with us or where to categorise us. But, uh, you know, I think we've certainly made a name for ourselves now. Absolutely, you have. Um, and in terms of the, you mentioned about you know having a, a passionate belief in what you're doing has enabled you to drive through some of those misconceptions, and actually change those conceptions here in the UK as well. But but talking about, and that takes a lot of courage. So talking about courage, I understand when you tried to open up in Dublin in the O'Connell Street branch, 
Um, I don't want to tell the story, but it's just I prefer you to tell it because it's just too good a story. So you you were delivered something in the mail. How did you? What was that story, and how did you actually have the courage to drive through that? Um, well, first of all, I wanted to open a store in Ireland because our parties were doing great out there. Sales per head were higher than anywhere else, um, and we just knew that uh, you know it was right for a retail store. And we found this location right opposite the GPO building on O'Connell Street. So. Admittedly, it was rather a controversial location to choose. Um, and as soon as the, the in fact, the, called the Dublin Corporation uh, got wind of, of my intentions, um, I got a letter through the post saying, you know, we would like you to open anywhere else. We'll find you a new location, but not here. Mm. Um, but we felt that was really right for us. We didn't want to be pushed to a back street. So I, I sort of guessed that maybe they had some preconceived ideas. So I invited them over to the UK to encourage them to have a look at our business, to meet our, our team, to look around our stores that were doing really well. And in the afternoon, I was meeting them in the boardroom. Uh, when I came to meet them, Kieran and Alan, actually, um, it was like uh, the good, good cop, bad cop scenario. No, one of them couldn't even look at me uh, for fear they may turn to stone, I expect. Um, whereas uh, the other one was the one that was trying to do all the talking and trying to persuade me not to open. And I, I soon realised, actually, they had their own agenda. No matter what I said, it wasn't going to make any difference. Um, and I said, look, I'm sorry, but I am going to go ahead and open. And I think their, their um, par parting words were, we can't respons be responsible for what may happen to you. And... Uh, Actually, um, that couldn't be a, have been further from the truth because to, uh, about a week before I opened the store in, in Dublin, I actually received a bullet through the post, which I'm sure you'll, agree, you know, you'll, you'll understand was a very scary time for me and certainly made me question whether I should be going ahead with the store opening. But, you know, I don't like to be bullied. I felt, uh, you know, felt very passionate about opening the store. Admittedly, I took a couple of burly bouncers with me uh, <laughs> as security. Um, and I actually went on the Late Late Show. It's uh, a sort of a cult, got quite a cult following out there. It was a live audience. Got a fantastic um, reception from the audience when I explained why we wanted to open the store there. I think they were quite incensed by the council for not, you know, for giving us so much opposition. Um, and we, we opened the, stop, uh, the store despite being served a writ on the first day of opening. And we had 10,000 people through the door. Uh, all signing a petition, um, and I'm glad to say it's in in our top three performing stores. So, and it's on the the tourist bus route uh, in Dublin. So it was a good decision. So that's going to take a lot of courage and determination. Talking, if we can open it up for a second into the characteristics of success and looking at yourself, but also looking at other people that you've seen to be highly successful. What do you think are sort of one or two of the key traits of a highly successful person? Well, you mentioned courage, Anthony. I, mm. I think certainly courage is something that I've always had. Um, and I think, you know, I don't expect anybody to start a business and have a bullet through the post, but certainly there, there are many challenges uh, when, when you first open a business. Just stepping outside your comfort zone, whether it means leaving a nine-to-five job and uh, and pursuing your idea, um, from you know, based on our very existence, you know, it's fair to say that uh, as a business we're fearless. Mm -hmm. And I think certainly challenging your fears is something I think successful business people do. Yeah. Um, so you know, on, on I think that's very important. I would say other characteristics, not letting ego get in the way of your business decisions. You know, it's. Uh, it's very easy to, um, you know, perhaps go with your own personal fantasies, and I don't mean Ann Summers' fantasies. <laughs> you know, I mean indulging what you think your customers want rather than, you know, is there really a market for this? Um, and, and again, not overindulging our, you know, business is doing great, let's go out and buy a fleet of fast cars, you know. I think it's very much about being grounded as, as, as well as having that courage. Yeah, because you talk a lot about, uh, as I understand it also, about mo people should move out of their comfort zone. In fact, you're quite an opportunist uh, yourself. So ha a lot, most people are sort of stuck in their comfort zone in the middle of a sofa getting a foot massage with a, with a glass of Merlot. But, so what would, what, what, can you elaborate on that point about the importance of moving out of your comfort zone? Um, well, a, a couple of examples I would give. First of all, you know, I think there are a lot of people that talk about their business idea or they talk about setting up on their own. 
um, but actually expect it to fall in their lap, and that's never going to happen. You know, you have to be proactive, and that does mean moving out of your comfort zone, stepping away from the familiar, whether it be your, your safe nine-to-five job. Yeah. I mean, I remember when I first, when I first started, um, you know, I wasn't, a, you know, um, an extrovert. I'm not a natural extrovert, but I, as I keep saying, I have this passion. Um, and I remember my very first conference for my team of people, my party organisers. There were 400 people at that, I think it was the Grand Palace Hotel in Brighton. And I knew I had to go out and address them. I'd never ever done a speech in all my life. Mm. So to go out onto stage and, you know, motivate 400 people is, it, it, you know, it will be scary to a lot of people and it certainly was to me. Mm. Um, but if you challenge yourself and push yourself to do something that is outside your comfort zone, it gives you greater confidence to then go on and do, you know, and strive and do many other things. And, uh, yeah. But you, you, you know, you have to make yourself do it. Yeah. Because in actual fact, you say you're not an extrovert. You seem like an extrovert to me. But, um, you know, you, you could have, you talk about the fact that a lot of people make excuses. I mean, you could have said you didn't have business education or any formal business education. You could have said that, you know, it's a male-dominated industry, so I'm not going to do it. But you didn't. You drove through that, didn't no, you? No, and in actual fact, I remember, you know, looking back, I, I felt um, actually not having business training or uh, experience, certainly no experience in retail or direct selling. You know, I thought that was a great disadvantage at the time. But, you know, it turned out to be one of the... Uh, I would say one of our main reasons for success because it, ac it actually forced me to rely on feedback from our customers. It forced me to talk to the staff at all levels um, and that's something we still do today. Um, and um, you know, I think it was actually was one of the advantages Absolutely. if I look back. Yeah. So challenging your limiting beliefs and turning it into an advantage. And you, you do, as you say, you ha you're, you're now not forced to focus on the quality of your education, but quality of the feedback from the customers. So, and you're known for doing that. So can you give us an example of you know, how do you actually practically listen to customers? And give us an example of how you've been able to incorporate customer feedback. I think customer feedback, it's become part of our culture. Um, and certainly we do it in many ways, whether it be through qualitative research, which we've invested very heavily in. Um, we have uh, panels of um, volunteers that give us feedback on products. We invite customers to feedback days. We have think tanks. Um, we involve staff uh, in think, pa uh, think tanks on a regular basis. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing how much you learn, you learn from, your, from your team you know, at, at every level. You know, I'll visit my stores on a regular basis, um, and only your, you know, only your store staff can give you that, you know, that real feedback. That they're the closest to the customer. In fact, many years ago, I did a program called uh, Back to the Floor, and that program inspired me to go on and in, encourage our directors to to get back to the floor. In fact, every Valentine's Day. Uh, over Christmas, in the lead up to Christmas, our directors go into store and work in a store for a day so they can actually really experience the frustrations that the customers may be um, or the teething, you know, the issues that the staff may be experiencing. Um, you know, we, we do encourage that and that's, you know, proved to, proven to be very important. Yeah, because as companies grow, they have a tendency, I think, for the management to get further and further removed from the customer. But everything you're saying there seems like you understand that is it can be a problem and that you reverse that. So back to the floor concept, that's just not just a chance to reduce cost on Valentine's Day. You, know, you actually get them. <laughs> <laughs> you, you actually get feedback. I think it was very them. costly, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. really, right. um, I, I, I think <coughs> any initiative along those lines is very important. Um, you know, we do, a, we do programs like Adopt a Store. So our key people at head office will um, adopt a store. We've got 150 stores, so each one will uh, play a, um, a key part in you know, ringing the manager, going and visiting that store. You know, I think it, it's very healthy. Yeah. Jacqueline, I've got to ask this question. Obviously, it helps, I imagine, being a chief executive of a, of a female-orientated business, being female. So do you think, uh, you know, a bloke could come in and run Ann Summers, or do you think it, it's really important that this chief executive is in the target market of the company? It's a very interesting question. Um, Generally speaking, when I employ people, I'll always pick the best person for the job. 
Mm. So um, if you're talking about the CAO level, you know, it has to be somebody that has empathy with our customers, that really understands our customers' needs. Um, you know, I'm sure there, there possibly is a man out there. I haven't found him yet. Um, and you know, if you look at our, if you look at our board, we have, you know, our board is split. It's fif uh, roughly 50% men, 50% women. I've in interviewed both men and women for, say, the MD role. Mm. Um, and I chose a woman, but that's not to say that a man wouldn't be capable of doing that role. Yeah. It's interesting. Let's talk about that for a second because I know you speak a at a lot of events and, um, on women in business and women in leadership. Um, but do you think that that whole issue of women in business is sort of, it's almost a non-issue anymore in the sense that companies do hire predominantly on meritocracy, as, you, as you've just mentioned, whoever's best for the job? Or do you think I'm living in cloud cuckoo land? No, I think there are still some people that don't uh, give women the opportunities that they that they should on the basis that I think there are a lot of women out there that have, you know, great talent and, and a great deal to offer. Um, and I'd like to think that most businesses do base it on uh, the best person for the job because that should be how it, you know, Absolutely. It should be how it's done. It's a no-brainer. Yeah. Should be gender blind, color blind, everything. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, because with people like Tom Peters, we interviewed Tom Peters, he's, we're a fan of, of his, but he, he was saying that you, know, you need to get increasingly more and more women in the boardroom, women are going to rule the business world, and you know, he's a fan of that. That's why I think over time it'll become hopefully more of a non-issue and it, it will I be hope purely so. And opposite. you need a balance, you know, uh, on any board, you need a yeah. you know, balance of opinions, balance of personalities. You need female input, male input. I think, you know, I think that's very important. Yeah, 50-50 sounds like a good balance to me. <laughs> Do you think though, that women uh, out there in the marketplace try and sometimes emulate the characterist male characteristics, thinking that that's what they've got to do to somehow get ahead in business? And that's got to be a mistake, isn't it? I think, I think there are some women that do that. I think it's a terrible shame. Um, you know, I think, why would you want to do that? You know, why what's wrong with who you are as an individual and what you're capable of doing? Shouldn't it be about you showing, you know, how good you are? And, uh, you know, I, I just think, why would we want to try and emulate someone else? Um, I, think it's, I think it's very important to be true to yourself. Um, you know, people respect who you are. You know, it's no, I, I don't get it, actually. I just, I don't get it. And I think it's a shame that some women feel they have to do that. I interviewed a, a TV personality not so long ago, and, and they were saying that you need to be 100% yourself. In fact, even 110% of yourself, you know, almost exaggerate who you are. Um, I don't think I should probably exaggerate who I am. Um, but, but to your point about being feminine, I mean, you, you, you embrace your own femininity, it seems. And uh, I'm going to quote you, if I may. Um, when I first started out, I wanted to be taken seriously, so I went through a phase of wearing shoulder pads, business suits, hair up and glasses. Then one day somebody said to me, you remind me of a politician, um, and that's the last thing I wanted, I can understand. Really. Um, I thought, this isn't about trying to emulate men. I'm a girly girl. I like to be glamorous. That's why I, what I want to be, and my success will speak for itself. So um, what advice would you give to women in, in leadership on Actually, that Actually, that point? story is absolutely true, um, because it was very difficult for me. You know, I was young. I you know, I was uh, petite, I was in a man's uh, industry. So um, at first I was worried that, I, you know, would I be taken seriously? You know, and I know from personal experience that um, actually being yourself is far more important. Being true to yourself, trying to be somebody else is very difficult uh, and keep that up all of the time. Um, and it's true, people will be, you know, people are going to be impressed by what you've achieved. You know, they're impressed by your achievements, what you believe in, uh, your values. They're not impressed by, you know, you know because you're a, you know, a, a desk hitter or, a, you know, I, I didn't go around beating my chest all the time. Um, in fact, I remember actually somebody saying to me, you know, your, your quietness unnerves me. So we mustn't underestimate as women, you know, how, you know, what presence we have and, and how powerful we are. So um, I think it's, I, I've, to give women their due, I think it is very difficult when you're in the minority. That's something I've experienced. Um, and I, I know from conferences where I've spoken that women come up to me and say, you know, I feel so intimidated. I'm the only woman in the room. And that can be quite difficult. 
But again, it's just reminding them that if they've got a great idea, um, you know, they should pursue that idea and not let, you know, not let the situation intimidate them because there are probably as you know, there's probably men out there that feel intimidated by their by their presence. So. Mm -hmm. I can concur that that sometimes <laughs> is the case. Um, what, what would, because it sounds like it's just about being authentic, 100% yourself okay. and being comfortable in your own skin, no matter where you are. And then, as you said before, move outside your comfort zone and don't take any excuses. That's kind of your mantra, it seems. I totally concur with that, yes. Um, talking about, you know, you're a very successful chief executive, uh, Jacqueline, as well. And um, so could you just... Tell us, you know, if you're going to give any advice for a newly appointed CEO, what advice would you give to a newly appointed CEO that wants to be a, a world-class CEO like you are? I think the first thing is to engage with the people that you're going to be working with. Um, you know, people are the, at the heart of the business. Um, it's always going to be difficult when you're coming in and stepping into somebody else's shoes and you've inherited a team of people. Um, but the, the first thing is to engage with them. And... Something I would say actually I do now, I, I think the other thing is to, obviously you're going to sit down, you're going to chat to the team, you're going to talk to them individually. And you know, one question I always ask is, if you were in my shoes, what would you do? And I think that to do that as a new executive, A, you're going to, first of all, you're going to learn a lot about the business. The individual that you're talking to is going to be flattered that you care about what they think. Um, it's going to be very enlightening. Um, and I think it encourages an openness and it says that you know, you're giving them permission to be completely honest with you and I think that's a very good start to being a new chief executive. That's great advice because I think a lot of chief execs think that because they're the top dog they need to know everything about in the business but it, it seems to me that it's just about asking the right questions to people you know, in the organisation and listening. It is. I mean, it's, you know, it's very difficult because every business has its culture and every chief executives have have their own uh, management style. Sure. So you know, but I, I think that's the one the one piece that suits suits all. Yeah. Well, everyone's got their own management style, but yours certainly is effective and it works because um, I understand you were voted um, by the DTI as one of the top 100 companies to work for in the UK. And again, I quote you: um, "If we want happy customers, we have to have happy teams." So apart from really listening to the employees, which is certainly an a, a amazing thing to do, what other tips or pieces of advice would you give on building a workforce that's really motivated? Um, I think there's a couple of things. First of all, um, you know, we've developed a business culture. I think that's very important that you've got consistency around the business. Yeah. You know, I, impl I employ smart, passionate people that I like um, and people that I think will work well together. In, in our business culture. Um, we have set about uh, values, um, people values, that everybody has bought into. So our values spell pride. So P is for passion about the business. We want to employ people that are going to be passionate um, and love the brand. Uh, R is for respect. People that, you know, we want the, the, our teams to respect each other. We want inclusive uh, inclusive relationships in the business so that everybody works as a team. Of course, our team have to be daring. Um, but that's not just daring in, in what we do, but also daring in giving them, uh, encouraging the team to step outside their comfort zone and maybe uh, try new things, come up with new, new ideas, and letting them know it's okay to make mistakes as long as they learn by them. And of course, experts in what they do. We will always select experts for, for the job. And I think everybody's bought into that and, uh, you know, everybody knows what the values are and, and, and feels part of it. Um, obviously, feedback make, uh, is very important, as we talked about earlier. Making people feel valued is the other thing. Um, you know, everybody has a part to play. No matter what level they are, everybody in the business is important to the success of the business and they need to know that. Absolutely. In fact, um, so what was the I for? Inclusive. Inclusive. Thank you. Listening should be another one, shouldn't it? <laughs> um, you say it's really important to build a small company mindset um, and, and, and continue that small company mindset as you grow, out, grow an organization. And I think a lot of organizations, as they grow, try to do that but find it very, very difficult. So, but you've done a great job at doing it. So any advice there? It is difficult as you get larger. Um, and certainly, you know, we face those challenges as well. 
Um, I mean, obviously, you don't shut your, yourself away in your ivory tower. You know, we have an open door policy, making sure that your directors, you have a culture where your directors get involved at all levels. You're just working in the stores, as I was talking about earlier, mm -hmm. you know, helps that. Um, and I think the other thing is to make sure that you, you know, you don't bury yourself in, in red tape, that you allow good ideas to be processed quickly um, and that decisions are made quickly and that there's not, you know, hundreds of meetings with hundreds of people um, that really just uh, weigh you down, um, you know, in bureaucracy. So I, th I think that's key. Keeping it sort of as light as possible without... That's good for running a, com a country as well, I would have thought. <laughs> Jack, and I suppose that Ann Summers is, is a turnaround company, um, but over a longer period of time. Whereas uh, Knickerbox is obviously, in the more traditional sense of a turnaround company, you, you, you bought it, sorry, you acquired it when it was £5 million in debt, and you certainly turned the fortunes of that company around. So advice from Jacqueline Gold on a uh, turn-up for a turnaround CEO, if you will. Um, well, when I look back to Knickerbox, when we purchased Knickerbox, the key things that we did, the first was to cut costs um, and use our own infrastructure to help us do that by merging some of the departments. Um, obviously, it was losing five million, so we had to make drastic, drastic cuts, which was unfortunate. Um, secondly, I think it was about um, reviewing the heritage of the brand. We, we, we bought Knickerbox because we liked the brand. Um, it had a profile. Um, but it sort of lost its way over a period of time and uh, you know we sort of took it back to what made it successful in the first place so that we you know a lot of people thought we were going to merge and Summers and Knickerbox together um, but we didn't we wanted to to retain the Knickerbox sort of um, identity what we did do however was introduce Knickerbox concessions into the Ann Summers stores which was great because footfall increased immediately you know, we introduced the Knickerbox customer to the Ann Summers customer and vice versa. I think the other point to mention, and certainly when you're in a business of selling product, um, is to you know, review the product and make sure that there is a fantastic product offer. Mm. You know, for us as a business, even now, it can make or break a season. Um, so we, we certainly gave the product a complete overhaul. Yeah, go back to, to the core, look at the product, mm. see what's working. Um, if we can, can we talk about, I mean, every entrepreneur and every, every single highly successful person like you has always had some failures, which makes the rest of us quite humble in the fact sense that we can, you know, oh, as I mentioned, we interviewed Michael Birch, the founder of Bebo, and the first three of his companies didn't really work, and then it wasn't until his fourth, fifth, and sixth that did work. You haven't had a lot of failure, as far as we know from my research in your, in your uh, career so far, but you have had one, and that was obviously with uh, Byte, uh, the magazine I think cost you around a million pounds um, lost there. So what lessons can we take from that venture that didn't work out so well for you? The biggest lesson for me actually with that project, and I don't regret trying it because you have to, you have to try new ideas. The biggest regret was not recognising sooner that this, was you know, this wasn't going to work. Um, and instead of losing a million, <laughs> I may have only lost half a million. Right, okay. um, and I think the trouble is, when you're passionate about something, you know, you do keep pursuing it. No, it's going to come right in the end, it's going to come right. Um, and if you've got a team of people on board, you know, they're all passionate about it. And it's a hard decision to make, is to, you know, to cut the cord sooner. And that's something I would definitely do today without hesitation. Okay. So trial and error is a, is a, is a key trait of any successful personal company, but making a unemotional judgment call on it earlier is better. So is that where the CFO can come in? And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe he didn't come in soon enough. But, uh, <laughs> so it's his fault, not yours. <laughs> yeah, we'll blame him. <laughs> um, if we can uh, talk around multi-channel retail for, for a second, I mean, we mentioned way back when that you've made it a lot easier for women uh, to walk into um, and buy sexy lingerie and sex toys, et cetera, et cetera. But assuming there may still be a slight stigma attached with walking into an Ann Summers store, in actual fact, any store um, like that, um, I'd have thought that the Ann Summers website and online channel would be generating more than 20% of your revenue at the moment. But I understand it's around 20%. So is that something you're looking to increase? Um, and what's your thoughts around um, yes, I mean, I, I'm a great fan of multi-channel, um, absolutely. I think, it, you know, it's something that business, you know, have to be considering. Um, 
you know, in today's environment. And I'm probably disappointed that our online isn't bigger than what it is. But you know, when you're a company that grows so fast, you go through a phase of throwing people at the problem, and then you're trying to cut back costs. So you think, well, maybe you know, we can have the marketing director in charge of online as well. What we've done now is we have a dedicated um, e-com director you know, with great experience. Um, so I think that's going to make a huge difference uh, to our business. Um, and as you probably know, you know, anything you want to do online seems to take forever. Um, but, you know, we are getting there and the, you know, our commitment is there. And I think that's, uh, you know, hopefully we're going to see some good things in the future. Yeah. You say you're a fan of multi-channel retail and, and we see that you, you are doing uh, all the channels. So what, what do you think is the key to getting multi-channel retailing done well with your brand congruent across all the channels? Well, it's simple. It's, it's you know, one, our, our mantra is one and some is one way to shop. You know, and it's one of our, I was going to say pleasure principles because that's what we call our strategy. But it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's one of the points on, key points in our strategy. You know, it's making, you know, the customer doesn't see it as, you know, different sales channels. She goes into a, an Ann Summers store and she's got something to return from party plan or she's wants to order something that's only available online, you know, you've got to, you've got to be flexible, you've got to be accommodating um, because the customer sees it as one brand. Absolutely. So again, going back to your listening to the customer and giving the customer what they want is absolutely paramount. Um, talking about what customers, customers want, has the economy downturn, of, the economic downturn over the last two years been good for Ann Summers in the sense that people are looking for cheap entertainment and potentially at home with some of your um, products could be a, a good way of attaining that um, entertainment? Well, I mean, it's been good in the sense that, you know, when people are feeling down, they want something to lift their spirits. <laughs> yeah. um, but, it, you know, of course it's been challenging. I mean, it's, you know, particularly for retail, it's, uh, you know, it's challenging for everybody. But we're very fortunate, you know, we're very unique. Um, and, uh, you know, we've, we've seen opportunities at this time as well. So I think... Uh, you know, opportunities in, you know, we've opened more stores, we've expanded further because well, there's been good deals to have. Um, I think there's opportunities to negotiate when, when times are difficult. Um, and, you know, we're pleased with our performance. I mean, we're doing better than last year. Um, we're pr probably not doing as well as we, you know, our ambitions, ambitions would have been a few years ago. But, uh, you know, we're still in a place a lot of retailers would like to be. Absolutely. And you're expanding, doing very, very well on that. So what advice would you give to other CEOs or people running businesses during an economic downturn um, that maybe don't have the same products and services that, are so, that lend themselves so well to a, a downturn like Well, this? the two key things that we did was, first of all, was to introduce a cost-conscious culture within our business just to eliminate any wastage at any level and um, the teams have really bought into that and I think that's you know that's critical. Um, the second thing that we did is we invested in our strategy. Um, a lot of companies may have thought no let's wait, let's wait till we get out of this you know when we can afford to invest half a million or whatever it might cost um, but for us we actually felt that was the right time to do it and I'm really glad we did um, and just you know, carry on being the best of what we do. Um, so those, those would be my three key things. Yeah, exactly. So being bold, but also being practical about reducing costs. So you're quite a master at reducing costs in yeah. economic downturn. Is a there is a bit of a theme, isn't there? <laughs> I know. I'm just picking up on this. And also during your time at Knickerbox, you did. So any advice on how to cut costs uh, well, but without having a massive impact on morale? Because you've cut costs, but you've also got an amazing morale in your, in your workforce. So... Yes, it's, it's true. We do have a cost-conscious culture. Um, I think, first of all, you have to get your teams to buy into that. Um, and we have a cost-conscious team that, you know, helps us achieve that. I think if everybody buys into it, everybody's on board. I mean, it's true, we've always run a very tight ship. Um, but everybody feels part of that decision, that decision-making. And uh, I think, you know, they know times are difficult. Staff understand that times are difficult. As a result, we've had to make very few redundancies. In fact, uh, any redundancies that we make is not as a result of the, um, the climate. It's more as a result of, you know, change in structure or whatever. So it's been minimal. 
I mean, we can only do that if we have everybody, everybody on side. Um, so, and it's about priorities as well. I think it's, you know, when you put your strategy together, um, it's about what, what costs are going to drive sales as opposed to, you know, the nice-to-haves. Um, it really is about, about priorities. Yeah, don't cut all costs. The ones with return on investment are good, <laughs> presumably. Um, yeah, because we've, we've interviewed a lot of CEOs on, on, on leaders in business so far, and it seems like they all have that belief you've got to be transparent in all your communications, particularly with employees and not trying to hide things in downturns as well. Do you know, years ago when I first started, mm. there was a different culture. You know, the feeling was that, you know, you keep things close to your chest and you don't share. But this, I, I totally buy into the transparency. I think it's absolutely vital. You know, it stops people speculating. Um, staff feel they can trust you, you feel part of the family, everybody feels as one. In fact, one of the things that we've done over the last few years to facilitate that uh, is that every month we have an all-comers meeting in our reception, which is a very large reception, but we invite all of the staff from all of the departments, um, most of which come along and they hear about what the figures have been doing, what our new initiatives are, so we keep them completely involved um, at high level so that they don't you know, they don't feel that uh, we're keeping any anything from them. So they hear about the challenges, they hear about the, the fun stuff, the, the exciting opportunities, and I, I think that's worked very well. Yeah. How do you make sure you keep momentum? Because you've obviously had so much success, but how do you make sure that the company doesn't get complacent in terms of, you know, we're, we've had the success, you know, how do you keep the drive going forward? I think, you know, keeping that drive going forward really comes from the top. Yeah. You know, I've got a great team of people. Um, a team that has admittedly evolved over the years, but uh, I feel we've got the b best board that we've ever had. Um, and it's, it's very important to then cascade everything down. In fact, we've just, uh, we've just updated our brand values. You know, that's very key to our business because um, it could easily be misinterpreted, but it, you know, it's been very key. We've put it on DVD. We're holding cascade meetings um, so that everybody throughout the business understands what this new initiative is and you want your teams to live and breathe you know what you're excited about. Um, Jacqueline you've turned um, Ann Summers brand into I mean it, it's got the same le level of brand recognition as Nike has in over here in the UK so tell us about how to build a, a brand that's got the same or has the same type of traction as or success that you've enjoyed so far. I think the key to our success uh, in terms of brand recognition has been, you know, when we go back to courage, it's about pushing those boundaries. And I, we're not afraid to push the boundaries. Mm -hmm. And by pushing those boundaries, um, not too much so that you shock people, sure. but enough that you set yourself apart from your competition and from everybody else, uh, in our case, on the high street, um, you become interesting. You know, you make yourself interesting. You've got a point of difference. Um, and, I, you know, I would say there's nothing like Ann Summers in the UK. Mm. Um, and so people want to talk about you. Yeah. And embracing controversy is something you haven't shied away from, because, again, it gives you something to talk about. But um, that strategy has, has worked well for you. Yeah, by accident, actually, because initially, you know, I embraced... Um, controversy yourself? <laughs> absolutely. I mean, you know, I've been arrested a couple of times. <laughs> and that wasn't because I wanted the publicity, I can assure you. It was Good. because I... You know, I really had a strong belief about uh, about Anne Summers and the whole concept, um, and I was frustrated and and that you know not everybody uh, understood what I was trying to achieve. Um, and then slowly I realised that um, you know actually that was part of who we were. And I, do you know what? I don't want to be acceptable to everybody. If I was acceptable to everybody, um, or the brand was acceptable to everybody, we wouldn't be any, you know, we wouldn't be any different. That is what our USP is. Mm. You know, I don't want to be competing with Marks and Spencers or Le Sens or, or, you know, we are unique and that's, uh, that's where we need to stay. Yeah. You can't be everything to everybody. In fact, um, talk, Steve Jobs, I understand, at some point may have received, or you, you're on his radar because of the eyegasm, and I know that may have got some, that may have been quite PRable, um, but tell us about the eyegasm and how that got onto Steve Jobs' radar. Yes, um, the eyegasm actually was a love egg, a vibrating love egg that you plug into uh, the iPod. 
and it vibrates in time to the music. So it was a great idea. Yeah. And um, yes, we upset them because we used the, the word eyegasm and also because we used the imagery or similar imagery to the iPod. It was a shame really because I think this was a great opportunity for us to get together and maybe come up with the 20 most sexiest songs and do something <laughs> together but uh, their lawyers didn't see it, see it in, such a, in, in the same spirit as we did. No. <laughs> and according to my research, and it may be an urban myth, but in true Anne Summers' comedy, uh, light-hearted manner, somebody sent some orgasms over to the board and said... Absolutely. Have and uh, yes, um, <laughs> we've sent a few people a few things. In <laughs> to get a smile back Absolute, on your face. Well, that's what you hope. Absolutely. If we can talk about, you, you mentioned earlier about uh, competition and that you are unique and you certainly are, but obviously other companies have tried to ride, uh, sort of ride with a trend of liberalization of sex and, and, and on the high streets, etc. Uh, Asian uh, provocateur, etc. Th those type of companies. So what, what do you believe is key in remaining um, competitive, both for yourself and also for other sort of you know, um, founders of companies that just want to make sure that they're they're number one in the marketplace? First of all, USP. I mean, it's the, the, one of the keys to our success. You know, um, you don't want to be copying anybody else. You know, you've got to be unique yourself. You've got to have something that sets you as, aside from your competition, whether it's a great service, you know, fantastic value for money, fantastic product. Um, you know, you've got to identify what makes you different. Being innovative, being first to market with your new ideas. Um, you know, you should be doing this in any uh, climate, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but those would be my, my, key, my key tips. You talk about innovation, I totally agree with you. On, on Leaders in Business, we have a whole channel dedicated to innovation and ideation. So how do you go about doing that in, uh, in Ann Summers, in terms of coming up with new ideas? I mean, for example, you send your people, I think, to the tills quite frequently to get ideas from customers, potentially. But. Yes, I mean, we get, we get, obviously, feedback from our customers. We have pleasure experts in our stores um, who certainly give us good feedback from customers um, and then it's about working with the suppliers you know you build up good relationships with your suppliers they understand what you're trying to achieve um, and then it's about coming up with something that, that nobody else has thought of. Yeah, easy for Jacqueline Gold maybe a little bit more of a challenge for everybody else but where does Jacqueline Gold want to be in 10 years time what do you want to be doing and then also what do you want your brands and Summers and Knickerbox to be doing or looking like in 10 years time put in the futuristic hat on for a second oh um, I'd like to 10 years time I'd like to be standing up at some conference big conference or convention in the US talking about our fabulous new stores um, you know as part of the research that we did uh, last year, uh, we looked at overseas expansion, international expansion, and that's something I'm really excited about. The timing has to be right and we have to do, you know, more research within the individual companies, uh, countries, sorry, but certainly the US uh, would be a good uh, a location for us, as indeed some countries in Europe. Mm. But I think Anne Summers is ready for world domination. Absolutely. <laughs> We're going to enjoy well interview you in 10 years' time in perhaps New York, San Francisco, Fantastic. Tahiti, and your other global stores. Um, and Jacqueline Gold in 10 years' time, you sort of be living in the UK? I think I definitely will be living in the UK because I'm a home girl at heart and okay. I want to be near my family and my roots. Um, but my heart will be as much in Anne Summers as it is today and as it was when I started. Jacqueline Gold, I just want to say on behalf of all of our viewers, thank you so much for your time today. I personally really enjoyed it. A lot of wisdom that you shared with us, so thank you very much indeed. Thank you.